And welcome to worship. This is our final Wednesday evening worship service. So next week, don't show up on Wednesday evening. Uh, okay, well, you guys, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, next week will be Monday, Thursday, our Holy Week services. So um, you guys uh, will be celebrating. We'll be, I'll be down there in Washington. So this will be my last time seeing you. I might see you on some random Sunday. You know, I'll be taking vacation or something like that. So I might see you on a Sunday morning, but uh, might not see you until December again then <laughs> for Advent. But it's been uh, wonderful being uh, here f during the season of Lent. And uh, thanks for the birthday cupcake earlier. Today's my birthday, so thanks for that. And What's that? Yeah. So, well, I don't have any announcements. If there aren't any announcements, then we will begin with our worship service. And I invite you to rise as we open with our, our opening prayer for, for this Wednesday evening. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we walk together on the road to the cross during this season of Lent, we pray that the Holy Spirit will fill our hearts with a desire to know Jesus more deeply than we have ever known him before. Set our hearts on fire so that our lives may bear witness to the world about the love of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our opening hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world, a light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and shine within your people here. Light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God. 
God's own face. You who sing creation's story, shine on every land and rain. Now as evening falls around us, we shall raise our songs to you. God of daybreak, God of shadows, come and light our hearts anew. In the stars that grace the darkness, in the blazing sun of dawn, of the light of peace and wisdom, we can hear your quiet song. Love that fills the night with wonder, love that warms the weary soul, love that bursts all chains asunder, set us free and make us whole. You made the heavens splendor, every dancing star of night make us shine with gentle justice let us each reflect your light mighty God of all creation gentle Christ who lights our way loving spirit of salvation lead us on to endless day May God be with you all, also with you. Let us sing our thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and pray. Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From all you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence are the light of our pathways. And you are the light and life of all creation.
Let my prayer rise up like incense before you. The lifting up of my hands as an offering to you. May our prayers come before you, O oh God, as incense. And may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Please be seated. Our gospel reading for this evening comes from Luke chapter 18, and this is what I will be preaching on this evening, beginning in verse 9. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in, himse in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. <clears throat> the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. 
But Jesus called, called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. The word of our Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, tonight we're continuing our sermon series using that, that book by Philip Yancey, uh, uh, The Jesus I Never Knew, and tonight's sermon is based off of his chapter, the, which he calls Mission, A Revolution of Grace. And, and as uh, we probably hear often, that, that word grace, that biblical kind of churchy word that pops up from time to time. And I'm going to really dig into that this evening. And in our English Bibles, the word grace is a translation of the Greek word charis. Charis. And, and you, you know that word. You hear it used maybe not as often as it used to be, but it's what we get the word charity from. Charity or charisma, charismatic talking about gifts, kind of if you're charismatic, you have the gift of being kind of likable, that kind of stuff, you're, you're gifted. But charity, giving gifts. Charis, grace, in this Greek word, is the state of kindness and favor towards someone. It, it is an attitude, an attitude of grace or favor that someone has towards another person. So, you know, in grade school, you, kids might tease one of the kids for being the teacher's pet because that kid who maybe is the teacher's pet, the teacher's favorite, they're showing favoritism, they're showing favor, they're showing grace. And that's what Karis is. It's this attitude, this freely given blessing or favor. And as the Gospel of John tells us, we know about God's gracious attitude of favor towards us because of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, we hear the word, that's John's word, way of talking about Jesus in the prologue, that opening of John's gospel, chapter 1. He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus entered this world to reveal to us God's grace, to reveal it, to show it, to pour it out. And that was his mission, and it continues to be his mission. God's grace is, it's all around us. We, it, we live because of God's grace. He's gracious. We, the air we breathe is because of God's grace. The most practical way, though, that we experience God's grace in our deep and intimate lives is, is through forgiveness. And tonight I want to dig into this parable that I just read for you from Luke's Gospel in the 18th chapter. And as I mentioned, we've been using this book by Philip Yancey, Jesus I Never Knew. And, and it's kind of been a guide for us in, in uh, helping us kind of uh, navigate through this season of Lent. And as I was reading through this chapter, Yancey briefly mentions this parable. He doesn't spend much time on it, but he mentions it, and he, and he kind of highlights how almost shocking this parable would have been to the audience. And he says that one of Jesus' stories contrasting a pious Pharisee with a remorseful tax collector captures the inclusive gospel of grace in a nutshell. It's, it is really a very short story. And it really does. It's kind of this very stark contrast. And especially for the people who would have heard it, that first group of people way back 2,000 years ago, it would have been really shocking to them. I mean, we just heard that parable, this Pharisee who thanks God that he's better than all the lowly people in the world, the robbers, extortioners, adulterers, especially that tax collector standing over there. And the tax collector, believing that he has nothing to offer God at all, pleads to God for mercy and forgiveness. And Jesus emphatically and radically proclaims that it's the tax collector, not that pious religious Pharisee who walked away justified in the eyes of God. And, and Yancey, in, in this chapter, he quotes an English writer, he's an Englishman, he, an author, a man named A.N. Wilson, 
who when he was uh, reading this story, he was really shocked by it. And he said, it is a shocking, morally anarchic story. All that matters in the story appears to be God's capacity to forgive. And I just love the way he describes that. Moral anarchy, the absence of moral order, moral lawlessness. And this is one of the most common reactions. I, a few weeks ago when I was with you, I talked about how Jesus' this, this Sermon on the Mount, that message that he proclaimed was this shocking message of, of the, legal, the legal side, the law, was so high, so impossible. It shocked people. Well, if, if, if it's that impossible, then why, is it, why did you give us the law at all? And it's because Jesus wanted us to know that it was all by God's grace. How can this be if God, this is the reaction though that people have, they're, they're shocked by it. If God is this reckless and careless with his forgiveness, then won't people just go around kind of doing whatever they want? Doesn't there need to be, you know, either, we, we think in life, uh, we, there has to be either a stick or a carrot, right? There's going to be a stick to kind of threaten you to do the right thing or a carrot to kind of incentivize you to do the right thing. And that's why people have trouble when they hear this shocking, revolutionary message of grace. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And people are like, wait a second. Don't we have to do something? Don't we have to participate? Jesus maybe plus being nice or Jesus plus love or Jesus plus tolerance or Jesus plus justice. You know, all those things. Don't we have to do something? In the New Testament letter called Romans, a pretty famous, pretty big, important one that the Apostle Paul wrote, he had already been hearing these questions and these even accusations of, wait a second, this is too revolutionary, this this idea of grace. And he anticipated, so Romans was actually a letter that he wrote to kind of introduce himself. He had never met the Romans, the, the Christians who lived in Rome. And he was introducing himself and introducing this gospel that he had been preaching. And and he anticipated their question. And he said, okay, grace, wonderful, God's gospel, this this salvation in Jesus Christ alone. And then he writes in in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Can, should we just keep on sinning over and over and over again? Because that just means God's just going to keep pouring out more grace upon us, right? Isn't that, is that how it works? He said, no, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We've died with Christ and we're risen with him risen to a new life. And that's what I want to look at this evening, what this means to be dead to sin by looking at this tax collector who is on his knees, knowing deep down in his bones that what he needs more than anything in the world is God's grace and forgiveness and mercy. And the first man in this parable is a Pharisee. And if you are familiar with the Bible, if you come to church fairly often and you read the Bible often enough, especially the New Testament, you're going to come across this group of people called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were, are, even today, you know, kind of often associated with being morally legalistic. And, and you can kind of understand from this parable, just right there, it kind of talks about how wonderful and great he is, right? And the Pharisees they were kind of like the, the moral ex- experts of the day. They were considered to be the most pious group of people in any Jewish community at that time. The rise of the Pharisees actually came about through kind of a long historical process starting way back during the exile of the Jewish people and the destruction of the first Jewish temple. So Solomon, the son of David, built the great Jewish temple. And Babylon came in and destroyed it all, knocked it all down, it was just rubble. And in that happened in the year 586 BC. And many of the, the leaders of Israel, the, the king and 
some of all of his nobility and the prophets and the priests, they were all taken captive and they were taken off to Babylon. And so people were left there in what was the southern kingdom called Judah, and they were left there without any leadership. And that was a common tactic for empires of the day. They thought, well, you, a, a country can't rebel if they don't have anybody to lead them. And so they took all the leadership off, and so we have like stories uh, like the book of Daniel, talking about Daniel, the, the prophet who was in Babylon trying to figure out how to be a, a good Jewish man whilst living in exile. Well, after the destruction of both the monarchy and the temple, the Jewish people had to figure out how to maintain their Jewish faith and their religion because the, the temple was the center of Jewish religion. I mean, imagine trying to figure out how to be Americans without a president, a Supreme Court, or Congress. I mean, some of us might enjoy that sometimes. You think, well, maybe we can just start over, maybe start fresh and uh, replace all of them. But, but it would be kind of tough, this huge country. What would we do without people kind of running the show, that kind of stuff? And all they had at that time was the Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. And so what happened is some of these groups started rising up. They would take the Scriptures, and they became experts in understanding and teaching the Scriptures. And the Pharisees were one of those groups. And they tried throughout those years, because it was about 500 years before all that happened until the arrival of Jesus and John the Baptist and that, uh, the New Testament stories. And throughout that whole time, the Pharisees and other groups like them were trying to help the people understand how can we be God's people. Eventually, they did rebuild the temple, but they still didn't have the Jewish monarchy. They did not have a Davidic king. And the Pharisees were kind of like those local pastors of a synagogue or something like that. If you wanted to know how God expected you to live as a faithful Jewish person at that time, you would listen to the teachings of the Pharisees and you would try to do what they say. This is why Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. They were considered to be the best, and you were supposed to be better than the best. <laughs> the Pharisees, they were kind of like the Jewish Marines, the few, the proud, the Pharisees, right? Sorry if you were in a different branch of the Marine, or military. <laughs> Tax collectors, on the other hand, were considered the worst, absolute worst. Tax collectors, they were usually Jewish people, Jewish men, but they worked for the Romans. The Romans at that time were the empire that was still over, uh, ruling over that whole land, Israel, the Jewish people, Samaria, that whole region. And one of the ways that Rome made sure people knew who was in charge was through taxes. Everybody loves taxes, right? It's coming up if you haven't done it already. Taxation was a regular reminder that Rome was in charge. And working as a tax collector for the Romans meant that you had a certain amount of power. However, it also meant that your fellow Jew Jews considered you to be a traitor, because you were working for the enemy. I mean, imagine if you grew up in a family who loved the Cubs and spent their whole life going to Cubs games and your family celebrated when the Cubs won the World Series in 2016 and, and you know, your dad is this huge Cubs fan that will sit in the freezing cold weather even when there's no one else there with him. <laughs> and then you go to work for the Cardinals. <laughs> That's how the Jews thought about the tax collectors. They were traitors. But then add to that, because they had this power, they also would take a little extra for themselves. So you think about if a tax, say you owe $10,000 worth of taxes, a tax collector might charge you $10,000 plus $100, so maybe $10,000, $100, which doesn't seem like a huge deal, but you know, add it up person after person, and over time, the tax collector could get pretty rich. And we know there's a story like that actually in the Gospel of Luke about a man named Zacchaeus. And when he met Jesus, he said, I will give back everything that I stole 
double because he had such a radical transformation. But that's what they did. They slowly kind of took a little bit extra, a little bit extra. Maybe they paid off the Roman soldiers that they worked with and things like that, but they would get rich off their fellow Jews. In this short parable, Jesus chose the two opposite ends of the religious spectrum to illustrate the incredible and radical revolutionary grace of God. A morally and religiously elite Pharisee on one side and a no-good, thieving, scumbag tax collector on the other. Obviously, everyone would have considered the Pharisee to be the super-religious, justified person, right? But Jesus praised the scumbag, the lowly tax collector. He praised the one who threw himself at the feet of God and cried out for mercy. He cried out for mercy, knowing completely deep down in his heart that he didn't deserve any of it, but he desperately needed it. The tax collector was the one who knew that he had nothing to offer God, whereas the Pharisee was saying, look at all these things I do for you. The tax collector was the one who fully accepted the truth that he was dead in sin, just like Paul talks about, or as we say in our confession on Sunday mornings, he was captive to sin and he could not free himself meanwhile the pharisee who everyone assumed would be praised by god was condemned he too had nothing to offer god i mean after all everything is god's everything and yet we are the ones that think that wow look at all the amazing things i've done to deserve this or to deserve that but yet we can't even have life without god This is why the great Reformation theologian Martin Luther taught something that continues to shock people still today, even though it comes straight from the teachings of Jesus and even from Paul, and it's illustrated in this parable. Luther taught that even our supposedly good works are sinful. And why is that? Because the super-religious Pharisee who did all those good things, those religious deeds, he used his good works to pretend that he did not need God's gift of free grace and mercy. See, even his best acts of religiosity and morality, he used them as a mask to cover up, to try to convince himself and the world and even God that really he didn't need grace because he had already done everything he needed to do. Our good and our righteous actions can give us this false sense of security, what we call self-righteousness. And there's another biblical churchy word that Jesus uses in this parable that I want to highlight as we finish. It's this word justified. When Jesus finished the parable, he said that the tax collector who cried out in desperation for the mercy of God went home justified. And that word justified is a legal word. It comes from the Greek word dikaio, which means to vindicate or to declare righteous. It's what a judge does when he's handing down a verdict and says, you are righteous, you are innocent. The form of the word means that a person who has been declared to be righteous and put into a proper relationship legally and morally. Jesus put that tax collector into a right relationship with God. Jesus declared that that man was right and legal before God. He was justified. And many people will quote Paul in Romans chapter 3.23 saying, All have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, humans, we're not perfect. We all screw up sometimes, but they stop there. They need to keep going because in the very next sentence, Paul says it's not a a period. He doesn't say fall short and fall short of the glory of God, period, and end end of discussion. It's a comma, and he keeps going. He said, everyone falls short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And right there, those two big churchy words, justified and grace, are brought together in Christ. And just so we are absolutely 100% sure we cannot miss it, Paul adds in this word, free gift. It's a free gift. 
We are justified. We are declared righteous by Jesus. And that is the revolution of God's grace. It is for you. It is for me. Jesus came to give it, to declare it to us that we are justified by God on his account. Because of his death and resurrection, he did it and he gives it away. Jesus plus nothing is really everything. And growing in faith does not mean growing in morality, growing in perfection, growing in some kind of visible, tangible way to say, look, oh wow, look at what a wonderful person that guy is. Growing in faith actually means learning how to die. Coming up on Easter really soon, we all love this great celebration of Easter, resurrection, resurrection. And what an incredible day it will be when all things will be made new. But resurrection cannot pl take place without death. And that's what Paul talks about is we, we die to sin and we rise with Christ. Earlier I mentioned that Paul, the Apostle Paul knew that when people heard this incredible good news that Jesus had accomplished everything and that they were completely justified before God by grace as a free gift, they might say, well, does that mean I can do whatever I want because God's just going to forgive me? And he, he said, no. How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin? We're dead. And now we listen to the voice. The only thing that can raise us is the voice of Christ declaring us justified. The only reason why we are alive is because of Christ. Jesus is the only resurrection. We are no longer alive on our own apart from Christ. But by faith, Christ is alive in us. All we have is Jesus and nothing else. He is the one and the only one whose voice we hear calling us out of the grave just like Lazarus. He is the only one who exalts the humble. He is the only one who declares, come home to your father's house, the place that I have prepared for you. For you. you are justified. I, when I was growing up, one of the, I, I don't know if my dad's ever told this story before, maybe I've told this story in the few times I've been here. One summer, I was at home, I was in college, I, I was at home and my brother Nathan, he would, he would uh, have a bunch of buddies hanging out down by the river and he, one night, they, they never, you know, like high school kids, you know, like, oh, well, get in trouble hanging out, spending, staying up real late. They didn't have any alcohol down there because it was right, the church uh, parking lot went down and I, not that they would ever do that, uh, you know, kids don't do any of that kind of stuff, but they couldn't get away with it even if they wanted to because it was right down the church parking lot. It was right down by the river that ran behind the church there. And cops would stop by because they would run, drive right by and they could see down in there and everything. And they would, cops would pull up often and stuff like that. And, so they, and one of their buddies' dads was a cop. And so they would go down there and hang out. And he had his guitar out and they'd play music and stuff like that. And they'd stay up till midnight, one o'clock, just, you know, on a Friday night, Saturday night. And one night, I was at home during the summer my brother's out there, and down at the, the fire pit that they had was at the base of a tree. And one night, down at the base of that tree, that fire got a little out of control, and they didn't realize it at first. But all of a sudden, they started seeing flames coming out of the top of the hollowed-out uh, uh, tree that had, they had, the fire pit was at the base of. So it had gone up the middle of the hollowed-out tree, and it was burning the tree from the inside out. And all his buddies scattered like good friends right now. <laughs> and he comes in and he tells my dad, and he wakes my dad up, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, knocks on the door and says, hey, dad, uh, the tree's on fire out there. And so my dad gets up and he goes out there and they hook up a hose from the house across the church parking lot all the way down to the tree. And they're just spraying down this tree, spraying... He tells my brother to go inside, go, get, go to bed, because there's only one hose, so he stays out there all night, hosing down the tree, just making sure it doesn't go completely in flames. And then in the morning, my mom got up about 6, 6.30, went up, got my brother, said, hey, go get your dad and swap places with him. And 
I don't know if he ever got in trouble or anything, but I don't think he did. And I just remembered that. That was that attitude of grace. There was no yelling at him, no getting angry with him. Just going to go out and help him. He, something happened, whether it's his fault or was it just an accident. He was going to go out and I'll take care of it, you go to bed. It was grace. It was mercy. It was love. Forgiveness. We didn't have to worry and wonder, like, is dad mad? No, just go to bed. We'll take care of it. We'll deal with it. And that's the attitude that God has with us. This attitude of grace and mercy. This attitude of love. And it's a free gift. And we know that because of Jesus Christ. We know that because he came into this world and died on that cross for us. This revolution of grace and mercy. Something that we cannot earn. And he never intended us for, to earn it because it was free. Because he loves us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace, this revolution of mercy that Jesus came to give us. We ask that you would help us to trust that, and that even in the midst of this world where there's things that happen, things that go wrong, and maybe it's our fault, maybe it's not our fault, but we ask that you would help us to trust that you love us no matter what, and that your grace is always a free gift that you want to pour out on us through your Son, Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. I invite you to rise as we confess our faith together. You can follow along on the screen. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, but long but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and redeemed me from the power of the devil. And he so preserves me that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that all things must work together for my salvation. Wherefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live unto him. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we take our offering. The light shines in the darkness. went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You shall bear a child and his name shall be Jesus, the chosen one of God most high. And Mary said, I am the servant of my God. I live to do your will. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant here and blessed me all my life through. Great and mighty are you, O Holy One, strong is your kindness evermore how you favored the weak and lowly one humbling the proud of heart you have cast the mighty down from their thrones and uplifted the humble 
Merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God and thanks to you. May God, creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be every light for our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all of 
of our days Amen. Let us rise for our final hymn. Go in peace to serve and love the Lord.